Well, good evening and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. We're on Saga 960 AM. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, interviewing a couple different people on COVID-19, and I'm really quite concerned about the mental health issues associated with uh, this pandemic. And so I thought it would be really good to have a psychotherapist, Satinder Brar, who is a registered psychotherapist uh, on our show, to find out how COVID-19 is impacting people and how uh, people can cope with it. Uh, uh, Satinder is over 15 years uh, working with couples and individuals to gain insight into relationships, resolve conflicts, and improve relationship satisfaction. She thinks that she truly understands the needs and, des and desires of humans. I wish we all did. And she has been featured in magazines, television shows, and is a TEDx speaker. Uh, she holds an MA in counseling psychology from the California State University. So Satinder, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Brian. So um, you're a psychotherapist. I've had a psychologist on my show before, and uh, um, lots of us think about psychiatrists. What's the difference between the three? Uh, so they're very similar in the work that they do, um, but there's a, a few differences. Psychiatrists mm -hmm. are, are able to prescribe medicine and typically are medical doctors who uh, specialize in severe mental health issues, and their treatment is usually through um, uh, medication. Okay. Psychologists and psychotherapists do a lot of the same work, whereas they both do counseling. Psychologists do a little bit more testing, like standardized testing, and psychotherapists um, uh, do more, uh, more strictly therapy. So therapy being talking to people. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. And you've uh, specialized in family and couples. Is that correct? Um, families, couples, and individuals. I do do, do all three of those. So I read a report. You. Sorry. I, I read a report that said that they think that divorces are going to go through the roof at the end of uh, this social isolation because people have never spent so much time with uh, whoever they're living with. Uh, what do you think about that? I absolutely agree with that. We're already seeing that in, in some areas. People are um, alone with their partners and looking to have all their needs met through their partner, um, which normally we would have so many different sources to have those needs met through our workplace, through our fitness uh, facilities, through friends, through family members, through our hobbies. And now we're with our partners uh, exclusively and the strains that were already there are probably going to um, get heightened. Really, you don't think that uh, spending some time with a loved one would be what everyone wants? Well, I think for some, um, definitely for some, it, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing and people are really taking advantage of it and you're hearing about it a lot on social media and, and you know, whenever people are asked who, what's the positive for you right now, most people do say it's spending more time with families, but where there are already strains and unhealthy patterns and dysfunctional families, um, there's no, there's no um, relief from that at this time. Yeah. What are the other impacts of uh, COVID-19 on mental health, do you think? I think the outbreak has really left people more alone than they have been in a long time or than or ever. Um, some are some, like we said, are responding by sort of hunkering down in their cozy domestic life, baking, reading, uh, organizing. But but definitely for many, um, many are beginning to fray. And at this moment, I would think the negative feelings and experiences associated with isolation are coming through for for all of us um, humans were social creatures um, although this the the pandemic is an, an unprecedented at, at moment um, this kind of seclusion that we're facing has been studied and it, it's been studied in astronauts incarcerated people immunocompromised and there's some patterns that have emerged that are helping us understand how it's affecting people and then how to improve your situation. Uh, first of all, it's important to remember that it's, the isolation doesn't just numb your brain. People are getting lethargic. And when they don't have positive inputs in their small world, we can, we can expect depression to kick in. Yeah. 
and um, depression and anxiety as well. And they're, they're kind of what some people will call sisters or kissing cousins. The anxiety is all around the uncertainty that exists right now. When, when um, we don't know, we don't have a definition of how long this is going to last. Yeah. When, when we are isolated in other situations like astronauts and they know um, the parameters, people tend to do okay with that. And often um, their mood will lift as they know it's ending. And we don't have that opportunity right now. Um, we're, we're feeling lonely. We're feeling confused. We need, we need um, clear communication from our government and public health officials. And when, and I, and I think, you know, I think everybody is trying to do a great job providing that. But people are getting information from a lot of different sources, which is leading to a lot of confusion. For yeah. people. Um, it also has, uh, the isolation also has a physiological effect. It's associated with cognitive decline, heart troubles, and a weakened immune system. And really? that's Why would it have cognitive decline? Because we're stuck inside all the time? Well, when we're under, uh, when we're experiencing stress, anxiety, and depression, it'll definitely lead to cognitive decline. Well, I'm going to take a break uh, so everyone can think about this, and we're going to take some messages, and we're going to come back, and I'm going to ask you more about uh, this impact of uh, of stress and anxiety on us. Uh, stay with us, everybody. Okay. Hello. Hi. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. We're chatting today with a psychotherapist, uh, Satinder Brar. Is that correct, Satinder Brar? Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, you were saying that there's a significant impact on cognitive decline because of living in an anxious time period. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, we definitely cannot function at our best when we're dealing with uncertainty, when we're dealing with a lowered mood or anxiety, which is fear and stress and worry about the future. Uh, research has shown that when we are in these types of conditions, we, we have difficulty concentrating, we have difficulty retaining information. And you say it also has a physical impact. Yes. And what's the physical uh, impact? The physical impact is that it, when we're experiencing these types of um, situations, uh, we will see a lowered immune system, which is exactly the opposite of what we need right now. But when we are stressed and we are depressed, our immune system doesn't operate at its best. Really? You'll also, you'll so also it, feel- So logically then we're more susceptible to catching it if our immune system is uh, weakened. Absolutely. And that's why it's so important to take care of yourself during this time. And yet they're closing the parks, they're closing uh, fitness centers, they're closing gyms, they're, they're closing everything where people would logically want to go uh, exercise. I had, uh, uh, a, uh, a psycho, I, I, I had a psychologist uh, on who said that one of the best things to do when you're anxious is to go and do what he called uh, bathe in a forest, forest bathing, get out to nature. And yet uh, we're getting arrested and ticketed if we uh, go out into nature and walk along uh, city parks. We definitely uh, have to abide by the rules that have been set up for us, and um, but find ways to um, do the things that are going to help us feel better. Um, yes, we can't go to the parks, we can't get out to nature, and nature, there's so much research around nature and mental health, but we're going to have to make do with the with what we have, make, going for short walks in your neighborhood while you maintain social distancing. Uh, many, many gyms are offering online um, uh, fitness classes, um, taking, taking advantage of those. So much of fitness classes, though, I think, are you know, either going to a class with other people, whether it's a, an aerobics class or a, I don't know, a, a exercise class, or just if you're doing weights, you're watching other people doing weights. Isn't there, there's a huge loss of that social interaction and, and motivation, encouragement uh, when we're all doing it alone, isn't there? Absolutely, there is. 
there is. Um, there, there are many places that are doing it through Zoom, so you can have that feeling of connection with others um, present at the same time. You can communicate with the other members that are, are doing it, but definitely, it's, there's a lot of loss. People are experiencing a lot of grief right now. What are some of the other suggestions you've got for people on how to deal with the stress and anxiety? I think one, is, one of the biggest ones is to keep to a schedule. Even if you're isolated at home, try to have a regular schedule as much as possible. Um, try to make the days feel as normal as you can. Uh, going to bed and waking up at a reasonable time. Start each day with a plan of a few things that you will do. Uh, keep a local a, a, a daily diary as well about how you're feeling, what you're doing. Um, keep a symptom log as well if you're managing illness. A symptom log. What's a symptom log? Uh, just uh, as well, just like a diary to keep track of how you're feeling. Are you having? If you're having a fever, keep track of that. If you're having a sore throat. How many days? To, you know, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Running Doesn't that nose? sort of make you focus on your uh, your problems more? Well, I think that's. I think it's only if you are experiencing those symptoms. I think it's important to have that information uh, during a time like this. If you do end up having to go to the hospital, right? Okay. And what else? Uh, stay informed. Right. Of course. Uh, use reliable sources, but it is important to stay informed and what public health officials want you to do and what the government is suggesting. We talked about it already, but staying active um, is, is one of the most important things to manage your mental health and loneliness during this crisis. Um, you, there's, a, there's things you can do at home, like go for walks around your neighborhood. If you have, if you have a treadmill or use social media to practice some low impact workouts like yoga or tai chi maybe it's something you haven't done before so i found that some people are spending way too much time on social media and getting into all these crazy uh theories of what went wrong and what happened and uh, it was caused by 5g and uh and it was man-made to uh to, to discipline the hong kong protesters, you know, all these different rumors. And then also some people are spending all their time watching CNN or CBC News Network and are, are just obsessed with the news and getting tired of it after a while, but can't plug out of it. I think it's really important to limit both the news and social media. If you find that it is increasing um, your depression or anxiety, you need less of it. I, I'm really suggesting to most of my clients to limit the news to 20 minutes a day. Oh, really? 20 minutes, that's all? Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that within 20 minutes, you can really get an update on what you need to know about our pandemic. I think longer than that does contribute to the lowered in, uh, mood and increased anxiety and fear. Now, are you getting primarily new clients uh, through this or are you dealing with older uh, clients, existing clients that are going through an even worse time now? Definitely, um, I, most of my existing clients uh, is the, the majority of who I'm working with, but I have uh, heard from many of our, my clients who had been doing better and had been able to be discharged. And this situation has now brought um, back those issues that they thought they had resolved. I have, I'm going to have an interview with someone that runs a substance abuse center, and they're saying that the uh, incidence of substance abuse is way up. Absolutely. And that um, is definitely part of isolation, um, sort of a um, retreat to your unhealthy coping strategies. Yeah, right. And so what, what's happening with people that, uh, you know, if you've been counseling couples that have got relationship problems, this is must just exasperate the relationship problems intensely. Absolutely. It does. I think um, when you're expecting your partner to um, make changes during this time, it, it's really difficult. I've been asking my clients to practice what I'm calling a radical self-acceptance. What's that? Um, radical self-acceptance. Really being very kind and compassionate to yourself, not creating these unrealistic expectations that during a time of immense stress that we would be able to um, 
make all the changes that we 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 had in a uh, picture of in our mind for ourselves i think people are there's some people saying oh well you have all this time and um you know if you don't utilize it and don't make all these changes then then what's wrong with you and i and i'm really of the opposite uh, thought that during this time of stress isn't a time to expect yourself to be your best and to yep. make all the changes you know it's interesting there was a show today and its title was it's okay to not be okay yeah absolutely and that's kind of what the radical self-acceptance is, that it's okay if you're not reading all the books. It's okay if you're not cooking gourmet meals every day. Just be okay with where you are. Really, that's interesting. So just, uh, you're okay, it's okay, transcendental, whatever, from a generation ago almost. Yes, I, 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 I really think that we can't put a lot of pressure on ourselves right now. But you said that, uh, you know, humans are social animals, and I think we really are. Um, mm -hmm. Wasn't the whole idea of social distancing completely wrong? We should have talked only physical distancing and really encouraged people to be socially active? Um, I, I, I do believe we are kind of using that language, like we have to be physical, physically distanced. But yes, I agree that maybe we shouldn't have used, labeled it that way because there are still opportunities to socialize. Luckily, yeah. we have technology. And yeah, I really think that we've uh, you know, had the wrong attitude when we talked about this social distancing. It should be physically distanced, but socially, we need to connect up with people. And you know, you're the expert, but what I hear over and over and again is that loneliness kills people. And if we're subjecting people, whether it's you know, younger people, middle-aged people, or elderly people, and I just, I can't imagine how terrible it would be to be in a senior's home today, whether you've got COVID-19 or whether you've just got other problems and being totally alone. Oh yes, being um, in the hospital alone right now, it, it, it's, it's a very scary, very scary thing. And while it's understandable, like I, I completely understand that those policies need to be in place. It's, set, it's setting um, up a variety of challenges for families and their loved ones. And it's scary. And I, I've really been suggesting to my clients to develop a plan. A um, couple of things like write out your medication list, an allergy list for everybody in the family. Decide who will be the family's point of contact if, if one is needed. Ensure that you have your technology um, with you. Create, I'm telling people, make a go bag. If you're I'm starting to get... If you're starting to get sick, it's kind of like when you're going to have a baby and you've got the hospital bag ready. If you are starting to show some symptoms, create your go bag, have your communication device and your charger in it, maybe a photo of your family to have with you if you are hospitalized alone, and to have a plan of who is going to be the point of contact for a family. You know, that's uh, a great suggestion. I had an emergency preparedness expert on, and he said one of the things that we... Uh, we don't do often enough, uh, either in business or in personal life, is the what if um, uh, questions. And he says, every family should sit down and have a what if conversation in regards to what if mommy and daddy have to leave? What if mommy and daddy aren't here? What if someone has to go and live in the basement for a week? What if uh, something or other happens? And those are the kinds of conversations that you, you should have. Would you recommend something like that? Or is that just too scary? Absolutely. I absolutely think that we have to prepare and um, those conversations, getting prepared, getting the go bag, making some decisions for every family, they, it has, you have to have those conversations right now. So being proactive and having the, the difficult conversations, but have them now so you're prepared. Absolutely. Well, we're chatting uh, about, with a psychotherapist about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. We're gonna take a break for messages and come back in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to the uh, Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting with Satin Bra, who is a psychotherapist, and we're talking about the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. Um, Satin, how are you coping uh, with, uh, with uh, this uh, social, physical distancing, isolation, uh, pandemic, et cetera? 
I'm trying to uh, exercise as much self-care as I can. I, I normally am very protective of that um, time, and I think everybody should be. At this time, uh, definitely there's challenges to, to doing the things that I normally would do um, to, uh, to take care of myself while I do the work that I do. But I am, um, my, I'm fortunate to have a gym that is doing Zoom workouts, so I'm doing those. I'm reading. I'm taking an online course. I have tried some new recipes. So I, I'm trying to do the best I can under the circumstances. So it's interesting. I was uh, president of the Mississauga Arts Council previously, and uh, we did a whole bunch of work on uh, the arts and mental health. And it turned out that the arts and creativity is one of the best ways to deal with uh, mental uh, health issues. And, and one of the best lines I liked that was a psychotherapist from uh, the UK that said, is that, let me see if I can get the quote right. When uh, your voice fails you, music and the arts can speak for you. Absolutely, I agree with that. And I think if uh, you have the ability to um, express yourself in a creative way right now, you should, you should do that. I encourage that, whether it's through music, or simply just taking a pencil to paper and drawing how you feel, writing how you feel. I think there's some- or new recipes. One... I'm sorry? Or new recipes, as you said. Absolutely, or a new recipe, yes. Or decorating the house, or cleaning the yard, or planting some gardens. All of that. Finding anything that um, feels meaningful to you yeah. is, always, um, is always wonderful. So there's that great book, uh, Viktor Frankl, um, mm -hmm. Man's Meaning in Life or whatever, that talked about even in the worst of circumstances, if you find meaning for yourself, then you can get through almost anything. Yes, I just reread it during the pandemic, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He, Viktor Frankl uh, was in four different concentration camps, and he really believed that in order to get through that time, uh, the people who survived found some sort of meaning. And... Um, and he believes that that's what drives us in life. If we find meaning in whatever we are doing, even in the worst of our suffering, um, that we can survive and we can thrive through it. One of my favorite books is uh, The Alchemist by Puello Coelho. And, uh, and in it, he, you know, and, and there's another one, Sid Harther by Herman Hesse. And each one of them uh, was sort of, everyone has different stages in life, different phases in life, different things we go through that uh, lead us on to our destiny. And, and part of what life is all about is dealing with the challenges in each one of them and getting something out of each one of those challenges. Absolutely. And, and I, I, I want people to be able to find that right now, find that meaning for them. And it's not possible for everybody. I think for those who are already dealing with mental health, it, this, uh, it's difficult for them to find that meaning. But even there, I've, I've asked my clients to do that. And when you do, uh, the suffering is a little more tolerable. How do you talk to children at this time? And what do you say to them? Um, with kids right now, it, it's a very challenging time for children and adolescents. Many of them do not understand the reasons for school closures, cancellations of their extracurricular um, they also are likely bombarded with a lot of social media because they have access to information. Um, they also, young people will sense the anxiety that their parents are having, the worry about their own health. Um, so right now, the best thing is acknowledge their fears, right? Don't try to minimize, rationalize, just say, yes, this is a scary time. Explain the overall risk of getting the virus and what happens if you do get sick. Um, I would tell your children what steps you are, you are taking as a family to ensure that everyone is safe. Uh, reassure them that um, the virus is very mild in children. And then ask them what questions, if they have any. Ask them if they have any questions and be honest in, in, in answering them. So be upfront, be completely yeah. upfront, Frank, and have the discussion with them. Yeah, this is an opportunity to build trust with your children. You don't want to um, have them go through this and feel like they can't trust the people that they're with all the time.
Right. What if uh, you're, uh, you have a loved one, a partner or, or someone like that that's unbelievably anxious about COVID-19? How do you deal with that? Well, it's important to support your friends and family, that's for sure. And it's important to listen to them and, and validate their emotions as well. But in order to protect your own self and your own mental health, you may have to limit that the time that you spend talking to them. Right. And I think that's okay at a time like this. And it's important just to be honest with them that, you know, we can't talk about that. It's that it's harming you to talk about it over and over. This and is someone that's obsessed with uh, dealing with uh, what's going to happen, what the issues are, how bad it's going to get, etc. There's definitely people who are obsessed and they're catastrophizing and you have to make a decision for yourself and about your own mental health and decide how much you're going to, you're going to talk about this. Right. What would you do if you had someone uh, that was in a, in a senior's home um, and alone? Well, absolutely. There's a need to protect, protect the elderly right now. Um, they are vulnerable and I understand the decisions that officials have made. Um, but I think what I'm hearing from clients is that um, they weren't prepared. Um, they weren't prepared and it happened very suddenly. And um, what I suggest though is to leverage technology, right? You yeah. Hopefully you can get in touch with the staff members who can help you um, be present with your loved one visibly if you can't be there physically um, and utilize that time to um, be be positive, be cheerful, share some happy memories, maybe make some plans for the future and reassure your loved one. I've heard of a couple of people that have taken their elderly parents out of uh, long-term care and brought them back uh, either to home or to a cottage or, or somewhere else where, where they can live because uh, they put them in the, the health care because they would have camaraderie, because they'd have better health care and because they were busy working and wouldn't have the time to take care of them. But now they're at home and they have more time to take care of them. Is that a good idea, do you think? I think that's a very, very individual and personal decision that you have to make based on your own circumstances. Um, in, in some circumstances, it just isn't safe to bring your loved one home right. because of the level of care they require and special equipment, access to, um, to, to the bathroom in your home. Um, so you, you have to make that decision individually, really, on what you believe is the best. I've heard that um, domestic violence is up. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately and sadly, that is true. Going back to what we said earlier, where, where there's already dysfunction and unhealthy patterns, and now there's um, so much time to be together, we're definitely seeing an increase in that, sadly. I can imagine uh, you and your profession end up dealing with people that uh, have these issues, uh, and, and the, the typical advice would be go to a shelter. What do you do now? Do you have to say, stay home and, uh, and deal with it? Or, you know, I wouldn't want to be going to a shelter and taking my kids into a shelter today, would I? It's absolutely a very, very difficult time for people like this. Um, if your safety is, is at risk, again, you have to make that decision. If perhaps there's, I know we're supposed to be socially and physically distancing, but perhaps there's a family member you can go to or perhaps you do have to call the shelter and and decide together with them what is the best for your for your safety right are there other issues that uh, you're seeing because of this living together in a confined space a little bit too much or more than we used to yeah i think just um disappointment and in your partner there's so many more um, opportunities for your expectations not to be met. Um, there's so many times when you are expect when you're spending so much time with your partner and you're expecting them to be there in a certain way for you and they're not. Um, we're definitely seeing an increase in the depression and um, loneliness. 
I guess the other side of things that we've, we've heard rumors that um, there's gonna be a lot of divorces, but we've also heard rumors that there's gonna be a lot of babies. So uh, maybe some couples are finding times to be doing some other activities. Yes, definitely. I'm, I think we will see both of those. <laughs> what about single people? That's gotta be tough if you're alone in a condo downtown or wherever, um, and you're supposed to be physically distanced from people. And you know, what do you do if you're alone, completely alone? I think you really have to utilize um, technology again. And, you know, we've, we've had so many debates about the pros and cons of technology, but it's definitely a blessing at this time. Uh, people are using uh, new, new apps like House Party. Uh, people are using Zoom at unprecedented uh, numbers right now to stay connected. You know, I'm suggesting at least 30 minutes uh, a day for my clients to connect with somebody. You can um, connect using technology, but I think uh, taking the time to write somebody a letter send, and sending them a card, um, those are all excellent ways to feel connected. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I, I, you know, some of your suggestions, uh, I try to keep a schedule. Um, I, I get dressed uh, for the office, not completely in a suit and tie, but I put on uh, more appropriate office clothes and I commute to my office. Um, I, uh, I to do a to-do list just like I typically do. I reach out to people on a fairly regular basis. And one of the other things that a bunch of people have done and I've done is just reach out and <laughs> excuse me, catch up with people. Yeah. I, I think that's excellent to stay in touch with the family and friends we have. And another suggestion I have is that there is a huge online um, world. And this is, a, this is a time where you could join a Facebook group about topics you're interested in. You could sign up for online forums about your hobbies or interests. You can play multiplayer games such as Word Feud. There's... Um, there's fantasy football for, for those who are interested in sports. There's a, there's a massive library of, of resources online. So use the online resources that are there and try to connect up with people. In other words, physically distance, stay in your homes, but don't socially distance. Make sure you've got that social interaction with people. And Absolutely. I love your suggestion about the, uh, preparing the bag. What'd you call the bag again? The go bag. The go bag. Preparing the go bag with your charger and uh, and your uh, your the picture of the family and uh, and then also keeping a schedule and uh, and and not uh, not just spending every day as if it's the weekend. I guess. Absolutely. Well, it's those really are great suggestions. We're going to take another break for messages and come back with. I'm going to ask you, uh, what do you expect uh, in the future? Uh, is this going to change anything? And uh, and how are we going to be dealing with uh, everything from the pandemic after it's over? Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crimey Radio Hour in Saga 960. We're talking about the uh, mental health impacts of COVID-19 with Satinder Brower, who is a psychotherapist uh, in the GTAA, uh, and GTA, not the GTAA, I apologize for that. Um, and we've had an interesting conversation where she suggested a bunch of different coping mechanisms, um, having to go bag, uh, talking about uh, what uh, would happen with your family, with your kids, uh, having a schedule, um, reaching out and, and talking to people, uh, having uh, lots of things to, to keep yourself busy and keep yourself active and keep yourself creative. And I think those are wonderful suggestions. Um, so Tinder, I wonder, do you think that this pandemic is going to change things? Some people are talking about that it's either going to be really difficult to come back um, when, uh, when we're allowed back out of the house, other people have talked about there's going to be a new normal and other people have talked about how maybe we're going to come to the realization about uh, that maybe our world was a little bit too busy and a little bit too frantic and, and there were some nice things about being at home a little bit more. What do you think is going to happen? Most of, the, most of my clients uh, that I speak to are really taking this time to look at what they can let go of um, and what they want to keep. So I think some of that we are going to see some changes after we resume back to our normal lives, people potentially will let go of things that weren't serving them and stay focused on the things that, that, were, that are important. Um, it's difficult to say with certainty as th this is such an unprecedented time. 
but I would hope that we, we are able to learn from this and we are able to grow um, from this and make some decisions that, that will make the world and, our, and ourselves better. But I also think we're gonna, there's gonna be some troubling um, factors. We're, we're gonna definitely see an increase in depression and anxiety and, and that's, that can be attributed to the, to the economic um, costs of this pandemic. Well, the, the layoffs, the wage reductions, the furloughs, uh, the bankruptcies, the, the close to bankruptcies, it's gonna be pretty tough. So because of all of that, we're definitely going to going to going to see some of the um, the depression, the anxiety, the divorce um, as a result of it. Now, one of the things about this is that you've had a fairly intensive time spending with loved ones. If you had clients that, uh, you know, weren't sure about the relationship before and then had a terrible time in uh, in the last month. What would you be counseling them? Because you know maybe they really learned a lot about their partner, but we're not going to be going through this again, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. What was the question? Well, you know, you've got a client, a, a couple yeah. that have had a tough time before uh, this pandemic, and they came to you for advice, and then they had a terrible time oh. together during this uh, uh, pandemic. Is this the crucible? Is this the sort of the pressure cooker that that proves that we're not meant to be together? Or no, we're not going to have to go through this again. So don't think about this as uh, proof of anything. I always like to give my clients hope. So I would encourage them not to make those decisions during this time because it is so unprecedented. And like you said, we're not hopefully not going to go through something like this. I would want them to look at the strengths that they do have in their relationship and try to get back to that level of functioning that they had prior to this. For some people that's possible, for others it isn't. But often when you're working with a therapist they they can help you see why you were together and maybe go back to that um, a stronger relationship that you had you know it's interesting you're such a positive person it sounds like you're always trying to persuade people to stay together are you ever do you ever like meet a couple and you say you guys are just wrong together like I don't I don't typically make that decision for them but sometimes it becomes clear during the work we're doing when week after week they're unable to make changes and they have to sit with the, with somebody and keep saying that. But I, I try not to make those decisions for them. It's got to be a difficult, uh, it's, it's, it should be an interesting role because probably too often in life, we want to give people recommendations and tell them what we think. And you're sort of uh, trying to help them talk it through and understand it for themselves and decide for themselves. Absolutely. It's a huge, huge part of therapy, empowering them and um, teaching clients to to recognize that they, they do have the power and the insight to, to make decisions about their lives. So if people are intrigued uh, by you and uh, need some help and they want to contact you, how do they do that? Um, I have private practice in Milton, which is just a short drive from Mississauga. Uh, they can reach out to me by my cell phone, uh, which is on my website. It's www.satinderbrar.ca. And how do you spell Satinder Brar? S-A-T-I-N-D-E-R-B-R-A-R. -R. Well, Satinder Brar, psychotherapist, uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you uh, tonight about uh, the mental health impacts of COVID-19. And I think you've been uh, very encouraging. Thank you very much for your time. And it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for having me, Brian. Good night. Good night. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio while we're on Saga 960. We were just chatting with a psychotherapist at Tinder Brar about uh, the impacts on mental health of COVID-19. And I think that uh, this is a conversation that really we haven't been focusing on. We've been talking about the health impacts a lot on TV day in and day out, and, uh, and of late a lot more about the economic impacts, and those economic impacts are gonna be uh, significant. Uh, I had a money manager on this past week, Hussein Ahmed, who thought that it was gonna be worse than the Great Recession, close to the Great Depression kind of uh, impact on unemployment and on bankruptcies and on, on GDP growth or, or, or lack of growth. Um, but mental health is obviously going to be impacted by both of those things, both the healthcare impact, the social isolation, the uh, physical distancing, the uh, staying at home rules. Um, clearly, if you've got death in the family, I think uh, 
Uh, this weekend, there were like nine pages of obituaries uh, uh, in, the, in the Toronto newspapers. And so, you know, all of us are going to be uh, touched, I think, uh, regrettably, by knowing someone that's uh, been impacted uh, negatively by COVID-19. Um, but then also the economic impacts, uh, layoffs, jobs, furloughs, wage reductions, bankruptcies, uh, close to bankruptcies, cash flow problems, liquidity, uh, um, financial portfolios that are down in value, real estate uh, values that are down in value. Uh, and all of those economic impacts and health impacts can't help, uh, but have a huge impact on our mental health. And so I think there's a couple of secrets here. Um, one is uh, some of the things that Satinder talked about, um, like keeping a schedule, um, having a go bag, making plans with a family, getting ready for um, everything, the, the worst uh, or just more time at home. Uh, I think some of the other things that she talked about and that other people talked about is be creative, um, launch a new something that I know one person that's been doing a puzzle a week, a big jigsaw puzzle. I know other people that have done a new recipe a day, other people that have uh, launched painting and, uh, and, and uh, new recipes on a regular basis. So creativity is unquestionably uh, one of the things that's going to keep you sane. I think the other thing that uh, um, we've talked about but uh, hasn't been talked about enough, which is stay close to people. Uh, it should not be social distancing. It should be physically distancing. We need to be socially close to people. Um, and I talk about this in a lot of my community and power co-talks. And go out and reach out and talk to someone. You know people that are desperate for your phone calls or desperate for your FaceTime calls or desperate for some sort of connection. Go out and make those connections. I had a a person to do business with that just sent a really nice email saying that they were concerned about me and wanted to make sure that I was okay. Well, you know what? That was nice. And so make a, make a habit, make a practice of that. One of the best examples of uh, someone that's did, done that uh, incredibly successfully uh, was uh, pri former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who had a call list. Uh, and uh, it was just different people he wanted to call every week. And whenever he had a break in the action, he would start making calls. And clearly he had a reason to do that. He was in politics and he needed to, to talk to people. But you know what? It's a pretty good practice. So reach out and touch someone and make sure they're okay. Good night.